Hi, the NanoPine Neo 4 is probably the smallest RK3399 based SPC on the market currently. But does it have enough to take on the competition? Find out in this video. Hi, this video is being sponsored by JLC PCB. JLC PCB can manufacture prototype PCBs from one to six layers with track widths down to 3.5 mil. They also support pretty much everything you can throw at them. So check the description below for a full list of their capabilities. For only $2, you can get 10 PCBs manufactured within 24 hours. And if you are a first time customer, you can get $20 off shipping off your first order. So go and check them out. The NanoPine Neo 4 is currently the smallest RK3399 based sock on the market. As you'll soon see, it'll keep that title for a while yet. So what have Friendly Arm crammed into this tiny 60 by 45 millimeter board? Starting from the top right, working clockwise. I2S header, gigabit ethernet, RTC battery header, USB 2.0 and USB 3.0 socket and an additional USB 2.0 header, debug UART, eMMC socket, HDMI capable of 4K at 60Hz, USB Type-C which is the best way of getting juice to the board, not like those micro USB connectors, power LED, status LED, external antenna header, MIPI CSI, and a 40 pin header with the first 26 pins Pi compatible with 3.3 volt tolerant logic levels and the second half providing a PCIe interface. The unfortunate thing about this header is that it has 1mm pitched pins and there's no adapter board yet selling on friendly arm so you're out of luck using a typical breadboard with this SPC. On the semi side we have 6 channel ESD protection for USB Type-C Programmable USB Type-C controller accessible over ITC, which is also used on the Nano PCT4 and Cadus Edge. There's a heck of a lot of these 0201 components on this board. They had to, given the size of this thing. 24 MHz crystal driving the RK3399 SOC. Wi-Fi module based on the AP6212. There's a crazy amount of 0201 components. These are 0.6 millimeters lengthwise, tiny. Dual channel LDO regulator supplying 3.3 volts from a 5.5 volt input at up to 300 milliamps on each channel. And yes, more 0201 components. MOSFETs for controlling power to the SOC. DC to DC converter for the GPU accessible over ITC. And yes, these 0201s are hiding everywhere. Moving on to the underside, we have SD slot, LDO regulator providing 1.8 volts to the SOC from a 3.3 volt supply and up to 500 milliamps. High efficiency PWM step down DC converter providing 0.9 volts from the 5 volt DC supply. And unknown component, 25 megahertz crystal for the gigabit ethernet transceiver. More of these six channel ESD protection ICs, one half of the one gig RAM, and the unavoidable RK808 PMIC, which is present on almost all the RK3399 based SPCs. 2 amp SLU control load switch, which operates within a 2.7 to 5.5 volt DC supply and controls USB voltage output. Oh, and look, more ESD protection and even more. But I wasn't able to figure out what this one was. Let me know in the comments below if you find out. DC buck converter providing 3.3 volts at up to 3 amps from a 5 volt input, which is interesting as the manufacturer has declared this part obsolete. Hmm. And even more EST protection, what else? And also the RK3399 SOC, which is underneath for a change. One thing I've been noticing with Friendly Arm is that there are a heck of a lot of components that are common across all their SPCs and every part has its own unique label. So for example, U28 on the Neo 4, which is the ESD protection IC for the USB Type-C port, is identical on the Nano PCT4. Or U8, which is the RK808 PMIC, is, yep, the same. Comparing the size of this SPC to several others, you can see Friendly Arm have packed a lot into such a little space. 
Friendly Arm provide a pretty chunky milled heatsink, which has a fair amount of thermal mass to it. They also provide their blue spongy heatsink goop, which frankly is not that good. Well, it's good enough, but if you want to really avoid thermal throttling issues, then a better fitting heatsink with thermal paste would be ideal. I actually prefer having the sock underneath. This makes it a more sturdy setup overall, but I know some of you don't like this. While I was screwing the heatsink in, I did hear some small cracks from the PCB. Like a lot of mass produced PCBs, they make them as thin as possible. And this one comes in at 1.2 millimeters, but it didn't seem to affect anything at all. I also purchased an EMMC module along with the SD card adapter, so I could test out EMMC booting. The power pack is pretty chunky. Five volts at four amps is a fair amount of juice to be pushing down some thin cables. I would have preferred to see a 12 volt DC supply as the lower voltage and high current causes all sorts of issues with connectors. As in all my reviews, I log both voltage and current using a power logger. So first of all, I tried the default friendly arm image running on EMMC. Both demo videos played back without any jitter which is nice to see that we're seeing some work being done on getting graphic speeds up to par. Instead of dwelling on the default friendly arm image, I moved over to an ambient image just to see how things were progressing there. However, one of the annoying things about this SBC is the placement of the SD card slot. It really is quite difficult to get access to it once everything is plugged in. Even unplugged, it's a tight fit. Once booted from SD card, log in to run through the final configuration and the desktop should start up in a couple of seconds. I left it on idle for around 30 minutes to establish a baseline. The temperature sat around the 53 degrees Celsius mark with a variance of only around plus or minus two degrees Celsius. The external heatsink temperature had a maximum of 43.8 degrees next to the sock and 39.5 on the other side. This was with an ambient room temperature of 32.1 degrees Celsius. The average load during this time was around 500 milliamps with a peak of around 1.8 amps. And the board shuts down to around 2 milliamps quiescent current, which is what I've seen on most RK3399 based SBCs so far. I then ran it through some basic benchmarks to see how much the temperature would rise when under load. Igor Pavlov's 7-zip compression benchmark raised the core temperature to 70.6 degrees Celsius, a bit of a rise in a short length of time. Interestingly, changing the frequency scaling to performance mode saw it rise by 3 degrees as compared to the on-demand mode. This heatsink does have a lot of thermal mass to it and it does get toasty. Like anything in engineering, a heatsink isn't just a heatsink and there are a lot of factors you need to take into account, like thermal resistance, fin efficiency, spreading resistance, interface materials. It's not just a matter of chucking a huge lump of copper onto silicon and hoping for the best. However, the problem with this heatsink is, I suspect, poor fin efficiency. So I have one of my handy dandy fans that I ripped out of something, somewhere. It's not elegant, but I was getting a much better airflow over those Neo4 heatsink fins. So the heatsink near the sock dropped to 36.1 degrees and on the other side, 33.3, nice. That was just a couple of degrees above room temperature. This drop also reflected on the sock where it went down to 39.4 degrees on idle. For my regular viewers, you'd know that where I live, things get a little toasty in the summer. Uh, so room temperature is around 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. This last week we saw temperatures hit around 49.5 in some parts of Australia. Just warm enough to take off my jacket. So I wanted some graphics tests. When I was reviewing the Nano PC T4 and Cadis Edge SBCs, one of the problems I ran into was the poor graphics performance. So has the RK3399 graphics driver improved since then? If you're running Arbion, which I strongly suggest, there's a forum post linking to a script that provides full VPU acceleration, which means that you should be able to run 4K video at 60 Hz amongst other things. So that's pretty decent, even for a non-RK MPP version. 
but you can also play it without using X Windows. However, when we move to a 4K 60 frame per second video, things get a little shaky. I suspect that it was because I was pulling data from eMMC and downsampling to 1080p. So still pretty decent for what it was doing. So I needed to test on a 4K display. Fortunately, my son had just bought one, but it was a cheap one and didn't respond properly to edit requests. This is a fairly easy thing to fix. Search for the right mode line entry in the xorg.log file and copy that. Then using xrandr, create a new mode, which should show up in the available modes. And add it to the HDMI interface and make it active. So I'm still seeing dropped frames on a 4K video. Hmm. Switching to another video, I saw the same issue. And yes, before you mention it, I did have composite disabled, but it seemed that I had to fully disable it in the XOR config file. Once I did that, a 4K video playing back at 1080p saw no dropped frames, although the video was a little noisy for some reason. Moving to full 4K playback saw a similarly smooth but noisy video. But playing a video within an X desktop window was still bleh. Apart from that, full screen 4K video playback is looking pretty good. Next on to Pharonix benchmark tests. I didn't run a huge amount of tests this time because really the Neo 4 SBC design is pretty similar to the Nano PCT4. So I ran a couple of benchmarks for graphics, languages and CPU load. And what did I find out? Well, I had some pretty interesting results. First of all, GL Mark II ended up being on par with the Odroid XU4, but I would have expected it to have been a bit better. While OpenCV was slightly better than the ROC64, the small PT GPU benchmark showed a fairly similar result to the Nano PCT4, which was expected. But the language benchmarks made the Neo 4 shine again, with Golang tests coming in just behind the Latte Panda Alpha. The interesting thing about these benchmarks is that the default Nano PCT4 heatsink does a pretty bad job of keeping the SOC cool. I would have expected it to be almost on par with the Neo 4. All the other benchmarks were identical to the Nano PCT4. One thing is for sure, if you're running PHP, the Neo 4 is the best SPC to be running. So another tick for a pocket server. This time around I didn't do any GPIO tests, but I'm saving that for a comparison video across several SPCs. So what do I think of the smallest RK3399 SPC? Like all friendly ARM SPCs, you're getting some pretty decent quality for the price. And since they are listening to makers comments on what to do right, they are one of the better SPC companies around. The size is great, but that one millimeter pitch GPIO header is a bit of a bugger. However, with a small adapter PCB breaking out the PCIe signals, this would be a great pocket server. That heatsink is a little too clunky and needs a fan, but apart from that, it is a well-designed PCB. There really is no room left to add any more components. So that's about it. Thanks for watching, and see you next week.